Hello. Welcome, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I just have to find my remote control. It's in my pocket. There you go. And I have a sign that says, don't forget to record this show. Okay. Anyway, this is our schedule for tonight. And I'm going to come back to that in just a second. Turn that off. And hit the record button. Because I'm going to put this on YouTube. For people, some people couldn't make it tonight. And it sounds like that's a little loud. So can everyone see okay and hear me all right? Great. Well, I'm Ted Barnett. My wife, Carol, has just disappeared. So she's already heard this, I guess. Just wanted to let you know uh, that occasionally during this course, there will be a few images which some people may find disturbing. Uh, but they will be shown very briefly. And I'll warn you so that you can look away or leave the room. But to make it up to you, I'll also show you some really nice images. So this is a really nice image, right? This is um, Michelangelo's David. Do you know about this? So he was on loan to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happened. This is what happened when he came back. That's one of the nasty images. I'm sorry, I should have warned you. <laughs> so, um, all proceeds of this are going to be donated to charity. And there's a reason we do that, because most of the information that you get about diet and health, and health in general comes from people who stand to make money from what they're telling you. And so it's hard to know when you're hearing something that's got a slant that you don't necessarily know about. So um, this is a picture that somebody sent me from um, the Wegmans of Canada. <laughs> This seemed kind of well, like a paradox, right? So you can come for your uh, fish fry, but then you can also come in for your, uh, uh, get your cholesterol tested. Also, I'm an imager, so I'm, and I'm a birder, so I'm going to show you some cakes and some nice pictures of birds. Anybody know what kind of bird that is? It's, like from, it's in my backyard. It's, yeah, it's a sparrow. Yeah. It's a, it's a um, American tree sparrow. So that, was, so that was a hard one. Here's an easy one. Yeah. It is. That's a, yeah, that's a black cap chickadee. That's the only kind of chickadee we have around here. Okay, here's this is a this is a bonus one. What's this? Any birders in here? It's a singer. See, Toey. Did I hear Toey? Very good. What does the Toey say? Drink your tea. Right. Drink your tea, right? Anyway, so I think this is a medical talk. So I've got to give you full disclosure, right? Um, <laughs> because I don't do on some chairs in Tofuti, and they make non-dairy versions of ice cream, cream cheese, etc. And the stock has not been doing well, <laughs> so I'd like to eat more Tofuti. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, Carol and I are the co-coordinators of the Rochester Area Vegetarian Society, and our family's been vegan for 22 years, um, which, as you know, means no animal products, no meat, poultry, fish, dairy, or eggs. So here's a... <clears throat> Just something I want you to take home with you. In case you have any, uh, ask, your, ask your doctor, right? This might be good for you. So why is, we're going to talk about nutrition history tonight. And why is it important? Well, because we're all ambassadors, especially people who've become vegans or taken, have some kind of a special diet. We're all ambassadors, and people think we're experts on the food choices that we make. So they say, why did you do it? You know, how come you're like that? So it's really helpful to be able to explain and to uh, even argue, because sometimes you're going to be have to argue. And I think people are motivated to, know, to change when they learn that a belief that they know to be true, that they grew up with, is based on information that was actually manipulated all along to alter their behavior. That's, got me, that's what got me going, actually. So uh, I hope this will help you explain your choices to others. So I'm a doctor, but I, I may know nothing about nutrition. So here's the drug. Be careful of any side effects. I'm sorry to pick on the doctors, but I'm picking on myself here too, right? So it's okay. So there is a history of USDA food diagrams, and these are various graphics that have been over the years. And the current graphic is my plate. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, is how we got to where we are. So I am a high-tech doctor. This is one of, the, one of my tools. I do angioplasty. Not at the heart. The cardiologists have the heart, but interventional radiologists have the rest of the body. We do uh, kidneys, legs like arteries to the uh, intestines, you name it. Um, but I also believe in low-tech solutions. So what about high-tech? Well, it empowers the medical industrial complex, and it's extremely expensive. Whereas low-tech empowers the patient, and it's inexpensive. 
Drugs and high-tech treatments often have negative side effects. Lifestyle, low-tech interventions often have positive side effects, like you know, you go on a diet to, for your heart and you end up losing weight and being happy. So high-tech makes a good living for its practitioners, but the problem is low-tech practitioners starve. <laughs> So, anybody know what this is an ad for? So this is an ad for Lipitor, and you obviously can't do this on your own. You need to take a drug, right? Because you're kidding yourself. There's another ad, same ad, same guy. Are you kidding yourself? Or same ad, different guy. For, uh, some people think exercise and healthy diet are enough to lower cholesterol. For two out of three, it may not be. Well, that's pretty pessimistic, right? Since almost anybody can do this, if they know how to, know how to eat right. But the drug companies don't want you to know that. So don't kid yourself. So guess who doesn't want you to be empowered? Well, that's what this class is about, is getting you to be empowered so that you can do this on your own. You don't need all this expensive stuff. It turns out that about 70% of healthcare expenditures may actually be preventable. So what about Lipitor? Well, here's a recent uh, uh, article from the New York Times from last uh, March, about a year ago. Eric Topol, who is a cardiologist at the Scripps Clinic, a professor of genomics at the Scripps Research Institute, and author of The Creative Destruction of Medicine, says, we're overdosing on cholesterol-lowering statins, and the consequences, consequence could be a sharp increase in the incidence of type 2 diabetes. So they'll tell you there aren't a whole lot of side effects with um, the statins, but anybody who's taken a statin will tell you, well, I get muscle aches, or my liver functions have gone abnormal. So, uh, and this was a year ago, but the past week, the Food and Drug Administration raised questions, and now they're making them label the, the statin drugs differently. So who knows who said that? Anybody Hippocrates. yell at that? Hippocrates, right. I don't think he actually said it that way because he was Greek, but, you know, <laughs> but he did say die, right? So, so this is Hippocrates, and uh, this is what he looked like. I know this because that's what Wikipedia says. <laughs> and who said this? Eat your fruits and vegetables and go outside and run around. Your mouth. Well, it's Hippocrates. <laughs> exactly. And what did she look like? She was really very good looking. Yeah. So who'd she say it to? She said it to the young Hippocrates, who was getting kind of antsy, right? Go outside, get out of here. Um, so, who knows what kind of bird that is? You have to have been to South Africa to know that one. So, that's a black, uh, African black uh, oyster catcher. Yeah. That's, that's in Cape Town. So, if you followed my advice, I do not expect to make money. I expect you to keep other, your, your friends will keep coming to me for their high tech stuff, right? But you're not you. <laughs> You'll probably live a longer, healthier, happier life without using medication, without spending money on health care. And if everybody followed my advice, there would likely be less human suffering, our nation would likely be stronger, our planet would likely be a lot healthier, and fewer animals would suffer. Well, that's for sure. So this is what you'll learn. You'll learn some basic facts about the forces driving dietary recommendations that will help you put future events into context. And you'll learn about some resources for delving deeper into the issues. So this is what I advocate to everyone. Eat a whole food plant-based diet with minimal added oils. This is kind of a, this is the whole class. Actually, after this slide, you can leave. <laughs> Get lots of exercise outside if possible. Be skeptical of any supplements. We're going to talk about supplements. We really, we recommend one or two supplements, and that's it. And we really are skeptical of supplements in general. And, and I think you should be. So uh, like I said, be skeptical. This is what I tell healthcare professionals. Be skeptical of supplements. Be skeptical of yourself. What are your motivations? Do you gain financially from what you advocate? And always ask, are we doing more good than harm, which is you know, the Latin, primo non no cherry, first do no harm. And our goal should be to empower patients so much that they don't need us anymore. How many professions can you name that should be trying to put themselves out of business? <laughs> your barber wants your hair to keep growing, right? He's not gonna tell you, he's not gonna give you something that's gonna make your hair stop growing. So that's silly. But anyway, what I tell other doctors, what you are about to learn should not leave this room. <laughs> Use this information to save your own life and the lives of your friends and family. <laughs> Do not share this with patients. It would be very bad for business. So these are some take-home lessons. There is a history of official nutritional advice. Official advice has changed over the last 100 years. At present, the advice does not promote optimal health, although it's moving in the right direction. There are many interest groups of influence over the recommendations, and confusion is one of their most powerful tactics, just like the tobacco companies before they admitted they'd been lying. 
Unbiased and accurate advice, however, has changed little over many years. Eat more fruits and vegetables and go outside and run around. <laughs> so, what else? The details are confusing and difficult to remember if industry likes it that way. The underlying theme, however, is not difficult to grasp. Conflicts of interest abound. Recommendations are often political and heavily influenced by industry and the profit motive. Grasping these facts is key to understanding the dietary mess that our nation finds itself in. So you don't think we have a dietary mess on our hands? Watch this. How many people have seen this map? This map. You come to this class, you've seen the map. Or you may have seen. All right, so yeah, a lot of people haven't seen the map. So this is a, uh, an obesity map of the United States from 1985. Um, if it's dark blue, the uh, adults have a 10 to 14 percent obesity rate. If it's light blue, it's less than 10 percent. If it's white, there's no data yet. Now, this is going to go forward in time. This is from the CDC. I didn't make this up. So as we come forward in time, all the states will fill in, so we'll have data from everywhere eventually. So now I'm going to play this little video. So that's 1985, 1986, 87, 88, 89. 90, new category, 1991, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, new category, new category 2001, and then 2005, another new category. So those are states that have greater than 30% obesity rates, the ones that are dark. And um, let's see, it's sort of the heartland of the country, right? And this is a real problem. So this is what it looked like back in 1990, 2000, and 2010. So every 10 years. <coughs> so these are the kinds of things that, we, that we're seeing commonly, right? And it's not just people. <laughs> you think that's bad, it gets worse. <laughs> So this is an emergency as far as I'm concerned. We have a real problem on problem our hands. And how do we handle it? How do we deal with this emergency? Well, here's an article from the New York Times from January 2012 about we operate. That's what we do for this problem, right? We operate. So this is a young woman. She's 17. Um, she's here. She's visiting her doctor. Here she is saying goodbye to her boyfriend before she goes in for surgery. And then um, this is a... Uh, after she, the kind of surgery she must have had is where they put the band around your stomach that's inflatable. So they can reach it through your abdominal wall to give you a local anesthetic and they just inject some more fluid into that band to make it bigger, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what she has to go through. So along with the obesity epidemic in America has come an explosion in weight loss surgery with about 220,000 operations a year. A seven-fold leap in a decade, according to industry figures, costing more than $6 billion a year. And the newest frontier is young patients like this girl age 17. I'm not violating HIPAA, her, her name was in the article. Ms. Kaufman, who has just turned 20, saw Dr. Sherwood in November and she had regained not quite half of what she had lost. So it doesn't even work, right? How about this? Have people seen this? Too fat to fight? This is from retired military leaders and it's an organization called Mission Readiness. And they're concerned because, why are they concerned? Well, maintaining the strength of our military and our nation will depend on new generations of young Americans who are willing and able to serve our country with courage, compassion, and sacrifice. So these are Joint Chiefs of Staff and various other retired people. And 27% of, so 75% of young, young Americans are un, un, ineligible when they show up in the, at, right, at the draft office. But, and 27% is because of uh, they're overweight. So this is a continuation of their monograph. Ready, ready willing, and unable to serve. And uh, just show you that this is their article. Their schools are selling 400 billion calories of junk food every year. The cool of them here were two billion candy bars, and more than the weight of the aircraft carrier midway. So obviously the military guys, right? I wouldn't have known that. So being overweight or obese is the number one medical reason why young adults cannot enlist. So who am I? I should believe me. Well, I have some credentials. I was an undergraduate at Yale. I majored in ornithology, actually. Well, no, biology, but yeah, it was a lot of birds. I went to Tufts for my medical school. Um, I have my boards in, intervention, in radiology in 1984. And then in 1980, 1995 is the year they gave the first um, examination in vascular interventional radiology, and I took that and passed. And that one has to be renewed every 10 years, unlike the other one, which 
that's grandfathered in. I've worked in nine states, two countries, and dozens of hospitals because I can't hold a job. <laughs> Although I did hold this job for a while. I was, for 16 years, I was the chief of diagnostic imaging at Thompson Hospital. Um, but the most important thing is, Carol and I have raised three vegan children. Because truthfully, that's really what qualifies us to teach this. Because we, you know, it's not really about the medicine, right? I mean, I have a medical orientation, and I look at it through the lens of a doctor. But the most important thing is that we have raised three vegan children. <laughs> and the question is, did they survive? <laughs> See their picture. Yeah, you'll find out, right? I've also published a little bit in the field. Um, this was an article uh, back in 2009 about a guy who developed symptomatic um, heart disease on the Atkins diet. People have heard of the Atkins diet? Yes. So Neil Barnard is the, um, he's the president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He's got some books over here. So we wrote this article together. So another reason, so there's just no money in this for me, so why not trust me? What the heck? <laughs> And also, I like to eat a lot. I think about food a lot. Luckily, Carol's a great cook. So, so what counts as official? So we're talking about the official recommendations, right? So actually, it's really whatever pub the public thinks of as being official, right? It could be anybody, but it's kind of what we think. So USDA is the lead agency. They are really the official organization that issues dietary recommendations. There's also um, the, uh, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which used to be the ADA. They changed their name, and it's really confusing now. But So I, I always think of the American Dietetic Association. I guess it's not just America anymore. Any medical organization, doctors, teachers, hospitals, schools, TV, radio, guys in white coats. I should have worn my white coat next time. Uh, people with serious sounding voices. <clears throat> and here's an economic fact that we need to remember. American agriculture produces more calories than we need, and Americans eat too much. Americans must cut back on consumption to regain their health. Any industry confronted with a recommendation to reduce the use or consumption of its products will fight back using any means at its disposal. Right? This does not mean they're evil, it's just the way things are. They have to make a living too. Alright, maybe they are a little evil. We'll give, we'll give them that. But one more economic fact is eating well and being healthy are just plain bad for business generally. There's really no business that benefits from you being healthy. Think about it, it just really doesn't. I can't think of anybody that would, that would benefit. So, what's our rule? Eat only fruits and vegetables and go outside and run around. So who knows what this is? Aspirate. I heard someone say aspirate. It's a special kind of aspirate. What's he carrying? See, this is a vegan aspirate. <laughs> we'll see a lot of those. We'll see a lot of those. So he's actually taking nesting material back to his nest. So, um, this is Marion Nessel. She is a professor of nutrition, food studies, and public health, and professor of socio sociology at NYU. She's one of the people who I look up to and who I have used uh, to, to help write this talk, this talk. And her book is called Food Politics. And um, even Julia Child thought it was great. She said it was a courageous and masterful expose before she put more butter on whatever it was she was making. <laughs> so she has a very good blog called foodpolitics.com. It's on your list of good websites. In, in, in your packets, you don't have to write down. Oh, well, it's a hard to write down. She is fantastic, and she keeps you up to date on what's going on with the, you know, the latest controversy. And so, who knows who this guy is? This is he's read the China study. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great book, right? Really yes. fantastic. And um, his new book is called Whole. And I, I highly recommend that. He talks about reductionism, which we're going to talk about later on here. And he's also a vegan hero. <laughs> Just to keep you awake. <laughs> Don't try falling asleep in there, it won't work. So what's the mission statement of his foundation? He uh, started a foundation a couple of years ago, and they promote optimal nutrition through science-based education, advocacy, and research by empowering individuals, and they use that word empowering, and health professionals we aim to improve personal, public, and environmental health. So one of the most important topics discussed in doc, uh, by Dr. Campbell in his new book, Whole, is scientific reductionism. Have people heard of that? So we're going to talk about that at every lecture. And I'm only going to just mention it a little briefly here, but you're going to hear more about it until you finally 
at least reach the understanding that I have of, of it. So let's let's do a scientific reductionism exercise here. Maybe that will explain why. Let's do a calculation. So the cow jumped over the moon. How does she do it? What's, so what, what's the, the thrust required of the cow's legs? What is your required initial direction and velocity if she wishes to make it over the moon and land back on Earth? Well, that's easy. If anybody took physics, you know how to throw, you remember how you wrote those formulas for throwing things up in the air and how long it took to get back? It was easy, right? We just need to know her mass and the gravitational constants of the Earth and moon. I could probably do this in half an hour or less. And how far apart they are, no problem. But hang on. What about atmospheric drag? What about, what, what, what's the change in drag with increasing altitude? What's the weather? Which way is the wind blowing? How long is her fur? Does she have horns? How long is her tail? Is it furry? How does she hold her tail while she's in flight? Where are her legs? <laughs> so, I have an idea. Where is it? <laughs> Assume the cow is a sphere in a vacuum. <laughs> That'll make the calculations much easier, right? This is what physicists do all the time, when they're or scientists in general. They simplify the, 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 uh, the problem so they can figure it out. It makes it easier, right? The only problem is, it's not, a, it's not the, the problem you're trying to solve. It's a different problem. So reductionism is about that, and we're going to talk more about that later. In the meantime, just think about how scientific reductionism determines the questions that science asks. Because we don't like to ask questions that we can't answer, right? We try to answer, ask questions that are easily answered, or at least have a potential of answering in our lifetime. So, anybody know about this, the World Food Prize in 2013? Oh, yeah. Uh, they went to Monsanto scientists. Uh, <coughs> How come? Because they invented GMOs. Great, right? But who, who do you think sponsors the World Food Prize Foundation? Where do they get their money? Monsanto. So the $5 million dollars that the World Food Prize Foundation needs to run themselves comes from Monsanto, and guess who they gave the prize to? Monsanto! Is that crazy or what? <laughs> I love it. So, so what does scientific studies show is the healthiest percent of calories from fat in the diet for someone with heart disease? Anybody know? Just yell it out. So the answer is 10, 20%, no added oils. So let's go to the American Heart Association website, and we'll go to their webpage. It says Fats 101. The only thing is, who sponsors Fats 101? <laughs> the canola, dot, uh, canola info dot org. Well, canola in oil is good for you. We know that, right? It's not a bad oil. Well, it's not true, actually. There are no good oils, but you know, canola and olive oil are probably the least harmful oils. You don't really need any oil. But how can you believe somebody who's got something at stake like this, right? OK, well, so I click on the canola info dot org. Now, remember, I'm an innocent patient. I've just gone to the American Heart Association website. And I click on that canola info dot org. <coughs> And I end up at the canolainfo.org website, and there's a recipe there for an antioxidant smoothie. Oh, really guess what? <laughs> Two teaspoons of canola oil. So you take something that's really healthy, right? Canola, right? A smoothie. It's got great ingredients, but of course, why would you put it on your website if you weren't going to sell your own product? So, so let's do an analysis, and you're going to learn more about this as the course goes on. So the total fat is three grams. Remember, I told you you want to get between ten and really 10 to 15 percent of your calories from fat. If you have heart disease, you should be down around 10 percent calories from fat. <coughs> so the total fat here is 80, uh, the total calories is 80, total fat is 3 grams. So let's do a calculation. I know another calculation. This isn't as hard as the cow jumping over the moon. So we got 27 calories from fat. That's out of 80, right? So 27 divided by 80, and that's 0.34, which means <laughs> This is now 34. You can't fall asleep, can you? <coughs> this is now 34% calories from fat. This really healthy smoothie. It's an antioxidant smoothie. But I just started at the American Heart Association. I did two clicks. I'm at uh, another website, and now I've got a recipe that's not going to help my heart at all. So, who said this? Begin with the end in mind. Anybody know? Yes. Do. Yeah, the guy wrote all the books. Exactly. I'll tell you. It's Stephen Covey. Thank you. This is habit number two. 
from the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I know it sounds corny, but it's a really good book, actually. So, by the way, we're going to run a little over because it's our first day and we start a little bit late. And uh, I'll make it up in the second, the first half is going to be until about 8. And then we're going to, okay? Then we'll make it, the second half is only about half an hour. So then it'll work. So what is the goal of nutritional advice? Because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to figure out what's the goal. Is it to help people live long, happy, and healthy lives? Or is it to increase profits for industry? Depends who you ask, right? So isn't the goal of a nutritional advice the same as the goal of civilization generally? Shouldn't we all be as a group trying to make our, you know, help ourselves live long, healthy, happy, healthy lives? That's kind of like why we all got together, right? And doesn't medicine itself share the same goal? <clears throat> Who said this? If you don't know where you are going, you might end up someplace else. Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra, exactly. Right. <laughs> a baseball fan back then. And you could end up with the standard American diet. Sad. The sad, sad. diet, exactly. So what are our goals? <clears throat> Longevity, happiness, vigorousness, that's what I think. <clears throat> Who said this? You can observe a lot just by watching. <laughs> Yogi Berra, same guy. <laughs> so this is not a secret conspiracy. You don't need to be a conspiracy theorist to figure this out. The signs are obvious. The tragedy is playing out in plain sight. The loudest voice is telling us how to eat have lots of money at stake. Corporations and industry are behaving just as you would expect. So, the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives um, is responding in back, to the, uh, to, back in 2008, I believe, to the 2010 Dietary Guidelines. <coughs> every 10 years, I'm sorry, every five years, the USDA and Health and Human Services put out guidelines, and they ask for public input. So this is the public input that came from the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives. And you don't have to read the small print. I'll, I'll magnify it for you. So NCFC will continue to advocate for policy based on sound science, and as such, to increase consumption of all forms of fruits and vegetables, nuts, milk, and milk products, whole grains, and meat. <laughs> to increase consumption, right, of all forms. But I thought we needed to eat less, because that's our problem, right? We're not eating enough. But the farmers don't want to do that, or at least the lobbying, people lobbying for the farmers. What about the next statement in yellow? It is also concerning that by pairing the statement above with a recommendation to shift food intake patterns to a more plant-based diet, people could easily get the idea that the government is supporting or recommending a vegetarian diet. Wow. Go figure, huh? So I want you to learn to read labels, and I'm going to go through this quickly because it's kind of tedious. But these are all the possible abbreviations that might end up on labels. Actually, the only ones that really end up in the modern labels are DV and RDI, I think. Um, but anyway, what do all these letters stand for? We're just going to focus on one, the DV. Who knows what that stands for? Daily value, right? Anybody know what that means? So, it's the worst. Because, it's on, and it's on every package I've checked. Every package that has a nutrition label. The package, packaging never tells you if the DV is a minimum you should try to achieve or a maximum you should try to stay below. Right? Because for sodium, cholesterol, and fats, it's a maximum. For most vitamins, it's a minimum. In fact, maybe for all vitamins, I'm not sure. I think for all vitamins, it's a minimum. So are you confused about that? You bet. And they like it that way, wherever they are. So let's, I promise this was going to be about the history of dietary recommendations. Let's review some history here. Back in, oh, so the USDA is the lead agency, and they issue most of the recommendations. So back in 1894, that's when the first food composition tables and dietary standards for Americans came out. You don't need to write this down, it's on one of your handouts. It's kind of cool, though. Um, 1916, it was the first daily food guides. What was special about 1916? So recruits are showing up for World War I, and they're showing up really scrawny. And the USDA is charged with figuring out how we can fatten these guys up. And they never got over that. They're still trying to fatten us up. Well, they're getting over it slightly right now, actually. So that's 1917, some more dietary guidelines. Okay, 1933, there were 12 food groups. They're starting to get into the food groups category here. And then that was too complicated, so they cut it down to seven in 1942. And that was too complicated, so in 1956, they cut it down to four food groups, which is what I grew up with. And my brother-in-law always says, you know, the four basic food groups are burger, fries, ketchup, shake. 
And then in 1979, the hassle-free guide to a better diet came out. Hassle-free is very 70s sounding, right? Then in 1980, we had some more guidelines. And that's when the first uh, dietary guidelines came out. Those are issued every five years now. So that's kind of what we're dealing with now. Then food labeling law was enacted in 1990. It didn't become effective until 1994, but the current food labels you see are from based on that. In 1991, the food guide pyramid was released, and then it was withdrawn <laughs> under pressure from the meat industry. And then in 1992, it came back out again. It was re-released, and it really unchanged. The meat industry kind of lost that one. They didn't like it because um, whole grains were at the bottom, and meat is kind of at the top. It's at a smaller part, and we'll look at that later. Then by 1994, that's when all packaged foods started having labels. 2004, milk consumption recommendation increased 50% from two to three glasses a day. That's pretty good for the milk industry, right? We're going to come back to that. 2005, we came out with My Pyramid. Nobody liked that one. Then in 2011, we got the 2010 dietary guidelines, and also MyPlate, which is our current graphic. Then the Food and Nutrition Board of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, they issues. They're the ones who issue the RDIs and the, all those little numbers, DVs and things like that. Um, RDIs. It has to do with like actual nutrients. And then the Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs, which was actually started by George McGovern in 1997, they set dietary goals for the U.S. It's one of the reasons he wasn't re-elected senator from South Dakota, actually. So what about the USDA? They're the lead agency. And what's their mission statement? We provide leadership on food, agricultural, natural resources, and related issues based on sound public policy, the best available science, and efficient management. But nothing about health. So why are they the lead agency? Well, what's their vision? That was their mission statement. What about their vision? Well, this is a real bureaucratic gobbledygook, right? To be recognized as a dynamic organization. Well, you can see it. A rapidly evolving food and agriculture system, but nothing about health. What about their strategic plan framework? Well, you don't have to read all that except for the thing in yellow, and I magnify it for you. Improving nutrition and health by providing food assistance and nutrition education and promotion. So finally, health makes it onto the list, but near the bottom of their strategic plan framework. So would the government actually recommend one thing while supporting something else? See, you know, that's why I'm telling you, you know, this is not a conspiracy theory. You don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to see this. It's all public. Well. Why does a salad cost more than a Big Mac? Well, on the left is what we actually subsidize. Meat, dairy, 74%. At the very top, you can't even see it. Vegetables and fruit get 0.37%. You can't even see that little thing. The one you can actually see is nuts and legumes. They get 1.9% of the subsidies. So almost all the subsidies go to meat and dairy. But what do we tell people you should eat? Well, the stuff on the, the thing on the right is what we're supposed to eat. Grains, vegetables, fruits, and the, you know, the, the meat's a little higher up on there. It's a smaller part of the triangle. And this is from the New York Times. Well, warning about fat, U.S. pushes cheese sales. This is from 2010 New York Times. A government-created industry group working with Domino's Pizza to bolster sales by increasing the cheese on pies. Right? Well, why is that? Because Americans have a cheese deficiency. <laughs> we need more cheese. And look what they're pouring on this cheese. Pouring oil on the cheese. Yeah. So what is, um, what's the name of the organization? It's called Dairy Management Inc. And what's their mission? Their goal is to get money, more money for the dairy industry. And they report their progress by, to the uh, Congress by tallying how many millions of pounds of cheese are served every year. So going back to the, these are the 12 basic food groups. Remember I told you in 1933 we got 12 basic food groups? And look, butter has its own group up there on the upper hand, right in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, uh, out of the out of the, the twelve, uh, I think what four out of seven, four to twelve are meat and meat or dairy, so animal products. Um, 1942, we cut it down. I'm sorry, 1940, we cut it down, down. So there's only seven because that was too complicated. Now, how many are animal products? One, two, three out of seven. So that's moving up a little bit. And finally, by 1956, then half of them are animal products. And then our heroes, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, came out with their food, uh, uh, new four food groups in 1991. Whole grains, vegetables, legumes, and fruits. And you can live a perfectly healthy life just uh, from those four food groups. So let's look at this graphic. This is the uh, USDA food pyramid that came out in 1991, I mean 1992. Remember, they had to withdraw it briefly. But if actually, if you cut the top three off, it's actually pretty good. <coughs> But you can see why the meat, and, the meat industry was unhappy with that, because they're a pretty small part of the pyramid. 
So that didn't last too long. They didn't like that. So, well, actually, it did last a while. Didn't it? it lasted until 2005. But uh, this is the. Uh, anybody recognize this? This is my pyramid, which some people still think is the graphic. Uh, in fact, I'm going to show you a news report later that they think that's the that was the last graphic. Uh, the, um, I'm sorry, the, the other one before that was the last graphic. But anyway, that's been replaced. Um, uh, in 2010, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine changed their four food groups to a the power plate, which is still the same four food groups. It's just a prettier graphic. And then the USDA came out a year later with uh, my plate, which looks pretty similar if you ask me. And in fact, if you'll notice about my plate, it's got food for three of the four categories, right? But the fourth one, protein, doesn't say what it is. It's just a nutrient, which is great. It doesn't say dairy, eggs, fish. It just says protein. Well, truthfully, there's enough protein in all your other whole food that you don't even need to worry about it because, as you'll learn later on in the course, protein is not an issue. If you're eating whole foods, you're going to get enough protein. And dairy up there is considered optional. That's why it's that little cup. So these are the industry groups with uh, input at the USDA. Dan and Yogurt, the National Dairy Council, National Dairy Promotion Research Board, Mead Johnson, they make milk-based infant formula. Nestle also makes formula. Um, Slim Fast, milk-based diet products, the American Egg Board, the American Meat Institute, National Livestock and Beef Board, but there's somebody missing. Where is the American Broccoli Board? <laughs> I just don't see them up there. So this is my pyramid. It came out in 2005. You remember one of our heroes is Marion Nessel. She says, the process the agriculture agency employed to replace the food pyramid remains a secret. It remains a mystery, for example, just how the department came up with a design for a new food guide that emphasizes physical activity but is devoid of food. That was scientific like in 2007. <laughs> so back when that was still in effect, I went to, you could go online, because this was effect, in effect until 2011, really. And uh, you could put in your, your height and weight and your activity level, and it would come up with a recommendation. And I, I kept, I've been giving this, I guess I've been giving this talk since at least 2005, because um, it was unchanged from then. And you'll notice that I'm supposed to get three cups of milk, right? And in fact, no matter how big you are, or how active you are, it will always say three cups of milk. It will never say anything different. The other numbers on there will change. Like nine ounces of grains will go up if you're bigger and down if you're smaller, whatever. But that, the milk is always the same. And it says get your calcium rich foods, but if you're going to do that, go low fat or fat free when you choose milk, yogurt, or cheese. Now notice they're, they're not saying you have to get your calcium from milk. If you read that carefully, if you parse those sentences. But they're implying it, right? Because the other stuff is defective. Anyway, so if you're going to take the fat off of milk, what happens to that milk fat? It gets fed back into the population anyway, right? It's not like they're going to throw it out. So they make it in ice cream, butter, sour cream, cream cheese, etc. So is this a responsible recommendation from a government body? When we don't need milk anyway. And what about the environmental cost of producing the milk fat and then throwing it away? So wait a minute. I'm going to show you a video and I'm going to put the mute this now. Would like Steve, Stephen Colbert is he okay? Yes. All right, come on. All right, go on. Nation, we all know the government wants to ram their health food agenda down our throats, which isn't easy to do since most of those throats are blocked by toaster stools. <laughs> well, folks, check out the Obama administration's latest attack on our bellies. So the U.S. government is making some new moves to get us to eat a little better. Um, this is the old food pyramid. There it is. It's out. Out. They're going to do something completely different. No food pyramid? But that was my favorite Egyptian mortuary-based nutritional diagram. <laughs> Even better than the food sphinx. <laughs> and, 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 and what are they proposing to replace the food tomb? The Obama administration plans to replace the much maligned food pyramid with just a plate. A plate? <laughs> For food? What's the connection? Americans don't use plates anymore. Our food comes from cases, bags, cans, tubes, and envelopes made of themselves. And folks, I gotta say, if you're gonna go with a circular food diagram with wedges, why not just use a pie chart? You see? You got, you got, your, you got your proteins, you got, you got your grains, and, and you got your fruit. And I, I right now, am going to have my serving of veggies. Be careful. What is 
technically a veggie. And don't forget to get your dairy. Just eat one of these a day for a balanced diet, and then you can have dessert. We'll be right back. So did you notice the mistake in there, though? They thought the food <coughs> was still the, the uh, graphic, but it had actually been replaced by my plate at that point. But the news agent, uh, outlets all had uh, the diagram that we, that we were mostly remember. So this is uh, the current one. Is this now? Can you hear me now? OK. Um, so this is my plate. And what did Mary Nestle have to say about that? Well, our friend said, this new plate icon makes it clear that healthy eating means lots of health, uh, vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. And for that alone, it's a big step forward. <coughs> the plate is easy to understand. You don't need a computer to use it. It lets you fill your plate with whatever foods you like without worrying about portion numbers. Best of all, uh, the messages that come with it. Enjoy your food. Yes, high marks to USDA for this one. So she liked it. I would cross off the dairy, but we'll take it. Oh, that's a mistake. Right. <laughs> hey, we'll keep we'll keep the uh, we'll keep the line up. So, what happens if you go back to myplate.org.gov, which doesn't exist anymore? They changed it again, but uh, they still use the graphic. But it's something that, anyway. So, if I put in my height, weight, and activity level and submit that, this is my, the plan I come up with. It's still uh, still three cups of dairy, but look at this. It used to say, this is for teaspoons of oil. It used to say, your allowance for oils is. Now it says, aim for. So if I read that, I think, okay, I'm not getting enough oil in my diet unless I get eight teaspoons a day. So is that confusing or what? They probably don't expect people to read it as carefully as I do. So now this is called my plan. Um, but it's the same recommendations. Um, and there's the dairy, three cups of dairy per day. And then at the bottom is this weird thing that says seven teaspoons per day of oil. Isn't that crazy? I don't, I don't know. It's almost like it's a food group, but it's not, it's not, on, the, right? it's not on the graphic. So these are the latest groups, and I'll just show you these really quickly. Uh, whole grains, um, fruits, this is good, veggies, protein foods, calcium rich foods, you got to get your milk, right? And it always says, but if you're going to consume it, go low fat because you don't want to, you know, all that milk fat because we know that's bad for you. What about if you go to Wegmans? Well, now you can get this thing called, uh, they have a graphic called Half Plate Healthy. It's pretty cool, right? Except, what about the other half? <laughs> Actually, Wegmans is pretty good. Now, they've been very responsive to us, so we're happy with that. Um, so this is the power plate from PCRM, and this they're graphic, uh, a wonderful graphic, uh, and there's a lot of people who think that there actually was significant influence from PCRM on the USDA. So these helpful food groups help you live longer, stay slimmer, and cut your risk of heart disease, diabetes, and high blood pressure. So, what do I recommend as percentages? Now this is a reductionist viewpoint. So you're going to learn this and then forget it, because it's not important. But you, you need to know it if you want to win arguments. So I guess you shouldn't forget it. So, so how much fat should you get? Five to fifteen percent of your calories should come from fat. Ten to fifteen percent protein, carbohydrates, seven to eighty percent. No trans fats, no cholesterol, and added sugar should be less than ten percent. Now, if you look at anybody's website, it'll say how much trans fat. Uh, sorry, how much cholesterol are you allowed? At any any of the um, medical websites, it will always say three hundred milligrams. And why is that? So you can have one egg a day because an egg has about two hundred milligrams of cholesterol. In it. The trans fats you shouldn't have any trans fats, but um, some of them allow that. So, or you could just forget that, eat a whole foods vegan diet with tons of greens and no to minimal added oils. And then what? Go outside and around. <laughs> so, if I go to the American Heart Association, what do they tell me? They tell me I should get 20 to 35, 25 to 35% of my calories can come from fat. And then the trans fat, um, it says three grams, even though you shouldn't get any, that stuff is toxic. And then, and then people know what trans fats are? That's when you see hydrogenated vegetable oil or partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, it's put into processed food to increase the processed food's shelf life and to decrease your shelf life. Mm -hmm. And the cholesterol is always 300 milligrams, right? No matter how, how, much you, how, much you, how big you say you are, it'll always say cholesterol 300. 
In fairness, though, I looked there recently and it wasn't there anymore. They took it down. So that was a straw man. So who are the, what's the National Academy of Sciences? I sure this. Uh, they were signed into being in uh, 1863. Distinguished scholars. There's 200 Nobel Prizes among their members. And you would expect the highest level of ethics from this organization, right? So that, remember I told you they're in charge of putting out the uh, um, dietary, what is it called? Nutritional guide, the nutritional recommendations, the RDI, that type of stuff. So they're part of the Institute of Medicine, which is part of the National Academy of Sciences. <coughs> And every five years, uh, they review and update recommendations for consumption of individual nutrients. Very reductionist. We're talking about some individual <coughs> nutrients here. But that's their job. <coughs> RDA, RDI, DRA, et cetera. And their most recent update was 2002, so they're falling behind. But this is from <coughs> their press release in 2002. To meet the body's daily energy and nutritional needs while minimizing the risk for chronic disease, adults should get 45 to 65% of their calories from carbohydrates, 20 to 35% from fat, and 10 to 35% from protein. So the 10 to 35% calories from fat, if you have heart disease, we already know that Dean Ornish and Colin Wesselston have demonstrated if you get your fat down around 10%, your arteries actually will open up. You'll get better. And if you don't already have heart disease, you won't get it. Further, added sugars should comprise no more than 25% of total calories consumed. <coughs> added sugars are those incorporated into foods and beverages during production. Candy, uh, soft drinks, fruits, drinks, look at this. The World Health Organization says you shouldn't get more than 10% of your total calories from sugar. They're saying you can get 25%. You know how, many, how much sugar that is? That's 33 teaspoons of sugar a day. But that's okay. <coughs> you know why? Because they got lobbied. Because even these organizations that seem like they're independent, they don't like it when the industry comes after them. Uh, for one thing, if they happen to have a journal, which the American Heart Association does, then you know, who advertises in those journals? So if you follow that, this would be an acceptable menu. For breakfast, you could have three cups of Fruit Loops, a cup of skim milk, and a package of M&Ms, and fiber and vitamin supplement. For lunch, you could have a grilled cheddar cheeseburger. And for dinner, you could have three slices of pepperoni pizza, a 16-ounce soda, and a serving of sugar cookies. <laughs> so the total calories would be 1,800, 31% from fat, and only 23% from sugar. You could actually have a couple more teaspoons. But how does this minimize the risk of chronic disease? Come on. So again, this is, this is a table with a bunch of numbers. Uh, but that's the lead agency, uh, USDA. And you can just forget these numbers and eat a whole food. And you can die with tons of greens and minimal added oils. However, the USDA is starting to recognize um, vegan diets. So this is the 2010 guidelines, and appendix number nine is the vegan adaptation of the USDA food patterns. So they do acknowledge you can survive on a vegan diet. So that's, food, uh, that's my pyramid, and that was what it was descended from. So I don't think that's really progress. However, this actually is kind of progress. Because for one thing, you can actually see what you're supposed to eat, fruits, grains, and vegetables, right? And protein could be anything you want. It could be beans, or you can just not even worry about it, which is what we tell you. If you're just eating whole foods, you're going to get enough protein. And we'll talk about that in the next, um, the next five talks. And just forget the dairy. Thing. But this is even more progress. This is the power plate from P PCRM. So look. So the USDA is moving in the right direction. We can see where they're headed. Why wait for the next set of guidelines? They're actually headed in a vegan direction. We're going to talk about osteoporosis for just a minute. We're going to pretend it's a disease of dairy and or calcium deficiency, even though it's not. And we're going to explain that in the next few classes. But let's pretend it is for now. We need to get a lot of calcium. So let's go to the USDA website and look at these tables. So there's uh, appendix B4 is non-dairy food sources of calcium, and appendix B5 is food sources of calcium. Does anybody see a bias there? Right? So this is all dairy on the right. That's food. On the left, it's non-dairy. That's not, right? I guess it's not food. It's still like that. I keep checking. I hope it's hoping somebody will get it. So there's a bias. But if you take those same numbers and you modify the table to make it uh, milligrams of calcium per calorie, guess what wins? Bok choy, collards, turnip greens, spinach, kale. The greens win this, right? The really healthy foods. There you get like eight, eight milligrams of calcium per calorie in bok choy. Whereas from milk, you're only getting 
two point, uh, let's see, whole milk, you only get two, cal uh, two milligrams of calcium from a, a calorie. Now, granted, you have to eat a lot of greens, right, to get, to get the calories. But you can do it. It's not that hard. And if you realize that the recommendation for getting, getting 1,200 milligrams of calcium, or 1,200 or 1,300 milligrams, is really artificially inflated. We don't need that much. We need about 600. You don't have to think about it. You're going to get it. It's, I'll give you a I'll, I'll, uh, um, spoiler alert. Right? <coughs> the answer is osteoporosis is a problem with weight bearing and vitamin D. And that's it. Almost everybody gets enough calcium. So <clears throat> this is the USDA. For example, lactose intolerance is, is caused by a deficiency of the enzyme lactase that breaks down the sugar lactose in milk and milk products. But why would 75% of the adults on the planet have a deficiency? It's like treating it like it's a, like it's a disease, right? Perhaps producing lactase after weaning is a real deficiency. Well, there are some populations where it was adaptive to be able to drink milk from your cow after you were a grown up, but not for most people. So is there any good evidence that increasing dairy intake will prevent or treat osteoporosis? And the answer to that is no. You would think there would be, right? One would think that with all the emphasis on dairy, <coughs> scientific studies would overwhelmingly demonstrate a benefit to dairy consumption, <clears throat> but they don't. So here's an article from Harvard, Chaining, uh, Laboratory, and the title is Milk Dietary Calcium and Bone Fractures of Women, a 12-year perspective study. This is 78,000 women. This was published in uh, 1997. And what did they conclude? These data do not support the hypothesis that higher consumption of milk or other food <coughs> sources of calcium by adult women protects against hip or forearm fractures. In fact, women who had more, had consumed more dairy actually had more hip fractures. It wasn't statistically significant, but they actually had more hip fractures. The point is, it didn't really matter if you were milk or not. So here's another article. And this is about men. These results do not support a relationship between calcium intake and the incidence of forearm or hip fracture in men. <clears throat> what about this? Conclusion. An adequate vitamin D intake is associated with a lower risk of osteoporotic hip fractures in postmenopausal women. Neither milk nor a high calcium diet appears to reduce risk. In fact, we're going to talk later about why taking calcium supplements can actually be, be detrimental and increase your risk of prostate cancer. So. 2010, these are the guidelines. Take, uh, drink three cups of dairy a day, or it's equivalent. But 50 million Americans are lactose intolerant, so what about that? Three quarters of the adults on the planet are lactose intolerant. Countries with the highest dairy intake already have the highest rates of osteoporosis and hip fractures. And what happens to all that milk fat? Like I told you, it gets fed back into the population anyway. And did Homo sapiens really evolve to be dependent on the milk of another species? Does that even make sense? I mean, if I told you here, have some dog milk, you'd say, well, I wouldn't do that. A <laughs> cow milk, that's okay. And can you name another mammal that is dependent on milk after weaning? So why did the dairy intake recommendation jump 50% to 2005? Any guesses? Lobbying. But what about that lobbying? Pretty special. So from two to three cups of dairy, not because <coughs> we need more calcium, <coughs> but because we need more potassium. <coughs> so the dairy industry went to the USDA and said, we have a calcium crisis. The USDA didn't buy that, but they did buy the potassium problem, and I'll explain that in a minute. It jumped from two to three cups of dairy per day. To compensate for the high sodium content of the typical American <coughs> diet, the DRI for potassium was set at twice the level that it had been. So in other words, because we're taking so much sodium, now we need more potassium to counteract that. Right? So since dairy foods contribute 18% of the potassium in U.S. diets, we should increase the amount of dairy. Even though they also contribute 33% of the sodium, which we then have to compensate for with more potassium. So it makes no sense. But somehow they got it through. So I'll say it one more time, because I really want you to remember this for your arguments, because I'm, I'm deputizing you guys. Fruits, vegetables, and grains are also high in potassium but have almost no sodium. So why dairy? It's high in saturated fat. Many people are lactose intolerant. There is no evidence that dairy can help prevent osteoporosis. Maybe somebody at USDA got lobbied. I'm not making this up. This is from the Wall Street Journal, that liberal rag. It's an investigative report from August 30th, 2004. A major victory for the $50 billion U.S. dairy industry. It attributed the 50% increase in recommendation, recommended dairy servings to skillful lobbying based on research funded by the National Dairy Council as well as the financial ties of several members of the advisory committee to dairy trade groups. So the, the Wall Street Journal is not publishing this to expose this evil, they're exposing it, they're publishing it to explain to industry, this is how you lobby, this is a good way to do it, this is what you should be doing. But it couldn't happen here, could it? 
So this is, uh, these are pictures I took in the Pittsburgh, New York High School cafeteria. Okay, there's, up there is a milk mustache. Milk can help prevent stress fractures and broken bones. Not true. And look at the, uh, over the, next to the door it says, choose one, choose two, choose one milk. So I would think that kids would look at that thing. That was a pretty official recommendation. It's up on the wall in my school. That must be uh, what I need. So it turns out there actually are some good people at the USDA. And this is from July 23rd, 2012. This is an internal newsletter published by the USDA for their own workers. It's not meant for public consumption. And what are they saying? Well, they're saying this, and I'm going to magnify that for you. One simple way to reduce your environmental impact while dining at our cafeterias is to participate in the Meatless Mondays initiative. <coughs> How will going meatless one day of the week help the environment? Well, the production of meat, especially beef, and dairy as well, has a large environmental impact. According to the UN, animal agriculture is a major source of greenhouse gases and climate change. Footnote, it's bigger than transportation. It also wastes resources. It takes 7,000 kilograms of grain to make 1,000 kilograms of beef. In addition, beef production requires a lot of water, fertilizer, fossil fuels, and pesticides. In addition, there are many health concerns related to the excessive consumption of meat. While a vegetarian diet could have a beneficial impact on a person's health and the environment, many people are not ready to make that commitment. Because Meatless Monday involves only one day a week, it is a small change that could produce big results. Did you notice that our cafeterias have tasty meatless options? So you can really help yourself and the environment while having a good vegetarian meal? Well, how do you think that played out? What do you think happened? So this is a news release from July 25, 2012, from the National Cattle and Beef Association. <coughs> Calls into question USDA's commitment to US farmers and ranchers. He says it's an animal rights extreme campaign, extremist campaign to ultimately end meat consumption. USDA was created to provide a platform to promote and sustain rural America in order to feed the world. Notice nothing about health, right? Yeah. This move by USDA should be condemned by anyone who believes agriculture is fundamental sustain to sustaining life on the, this planet. And then he says a lot more, but um, I'll skip that. So he also said this, they will not remain silent as USDA turns its back on cattle and consumers. So here's that nice little newsletter I showed you. <coughs> What do you think happened to that? It's gone. It was up for two days on their website. Now, I happen to have a copy of it because a lot of people downloaded it before they took it out. But you can't find that on the USDA website anymore. And the New York Times did an article the same day, retracting a plug for Meatless Monday. So remember, the USDA is the lead agency responsible for promulgating dietary recommendations in the US. How much can you trust the USDA? Who said this? It is difficult to get a man to understand something when his job depends on not understanding it. <laughs> who knows that? <laughs> who knows who said that? It's a great quote, right? Yeah. And the more you think about it, the more, the more obvious yeah. it becomes. Yeah. So Upton Sinclair said that. What did he write? He wrote The Jungle. And what was special about The Jungle? It was about the meatpacking industry, right? And what did it lead to? It actually eventually led to the FDA, Food Drug, and Drug Administration. There was another organization before that, another agency, but they were descended from that. So these are key recommendations from the USDA pamphlet from 2011. They want you to reduce those things, and they want you to increase those things, and I'm going to show you what those things are. These are the foods you should increase. I know it's small, um, and I'm going to summarize it for you. Foods to increase. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, dairy, seafood, nuts, and oils. In other words, pretty much everything except meat and poultry. And notice, actual foods are named for things you're supposed to increase. What about foods you're supposed to reduce? Well, sodium, saturated fat, cholesterol, trans fat, solid fats and added sugars, <coughs> alcohol. So these are the, the sodium, saturated fats, cholesterol, trans fats, solid fats and added sugars. Reduce these things. But notice, it's not actual food they're naming, because we don't want to get in trouble with any lobbies. Only nutrients are needed. And in fact, just even saying this gets you in trouble with the sugar lobby big time, which is a very powerful lobby. So, like any good parents, my wife and I performed an experiment on our children. You guys have done that, right? In 1991, we decided to become vegan. I'm 
she <laughs> Time for a break. Carol, it's up to you now. Hello, everyone. I'm Carol, and I just want to say a few words about the food samples for today. I made a green salad with my homemade salad dressing. I made pasta with beans and greens. I made it two ways. I made it um, with gluten-free brown rice pasta. And that version I made with escarole, which is a pretty mild green, but very favored in Italian cooking. Now those I put, you can have either or both, but those I put on the yellow tablecloth. The other version I made was with whole wheat pasta, and that's with the bowls. The uh, brown rice pasta is the curly cues, the uh, fusilli, rot rotini, whatever, corkscrews. Um, the bows are whole wheat pasta, and I made that with broccoli, my own personal favorite green. Broccoli rab, rapini, rape, it comes with different names. It's quite bitter, but I think absolutely delicious. So you can choose either or, definitely if you're gluten-free, choose the ones on the yellow tablecloth, but um, there's plenty for you to take seconds and try both. I also made a chocolate cake. Now, I always make chocolate cake that has no eggs, no dairy. This time I also made it gluten-free. Oh, thank you. So, okay, I want you to tell me what you think of it. It's, this is my first try, and it's a little crumbly. Now I'm going to tweak it. If you t if you if it, you think it tastes good, I think it could be tweaked to have a better texture. But one thing I will say is, um, I have a lot of good things to say about Wegmans, but I think this is better than Wegmans packaged gluten-free cake because that thing is a sugar bomb. It is too sweet. This is not too sweet. I think you'll like that part of it. But see for yourselves. Um, and as I said, there's plenty for seconds, and uh, you can go circulate both sides of the table. And why don't you start sampling? So let's talk about heart disease. Raise your hand if you have heard of Lipitor. <laughs> Dean Ornish? <Yeah. clears throat> Caldwell Esselstyn. Yeah. Excellent. Well, you know, when they started giving this talk, nobody would raise their hand for Caldwell Esselstyn. But he's getting pretty famous. So, um, I know what you're thinking. This is, I'm talking to doctors. I've never heard of Dr. Esselstyn, therefore he can't be important. <laughs> but who is he? He's this guy. Um, he was a surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic for over 35 years, recently retired. A member of the Board of Governors at the Cleveland Clinic. President of the medical staff and former president of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons. He's taken out a lot of thyroid glands in his life. He also is an Olympic gold medalist. In 1956, he was on the rowing team. That to me is the most impressive thing about him. And he also got, uh, was in Vietnam and got a bronze star. And also was the first recipient of the Benjamin Spock Award for Compassion and Medicine. And even better, he got inducted into the Vegetarian Hall of Fame in 2010. <clears throat> he may be more embarrassed about that than anybody. He had no choice. He was inducted. <laughs> That's from the uh, Olympics. Uh, that was the team he was on. I had to prove it to myself. I looked it up online. There it is. And this is his book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, which I highly recommend, especially if you have heart disease or if you're concerned about getting it. This is basically the 10% calorie from fat, no added oils diet. And if you Google no oil, you will end up with a little video of him on YouTube going, no oil. <laughs> he's really tall and very intimidating. And very, very nice guy, but he's a little scary. So that's how he gets his patients to, uh, to comply. He just terrifies them. So what's the plan? Lots of greens, legumes, whole grains, fruit, no nuts or oil. No nuts either. No avocados, no coconuts. So we're going to talk about that at a later date. But if you have heart disease and you want to get over it, like if you actually have, are having angina and they're going to operate on you tomorrow, you can go on this diet. And you may avoid the operation. And if you can make it for more than a couple of days, I guarantee you'll avoid the operation. No animal products at all. Um, so he did a study, which we're going to talk about more next week. We'll be talking about heart disease uh, and cancer and diabetes. Uh, but in his study group, the average started out with a cholesterol of 246. And during the study, their cholesterol was down to 132. His goal was to get their cholesterol under 150. And they all had angiograms. And their arteries opened up. So when I was in medical school, we were taught that arteries are made of concrete. At least that's what I visualized. 
And if you had a narrowing, it wasn't going to get better, right? It was just going to keep getting worse. It turns out that those plaques are in a dynamic equilibrium with your blood. Now, you're never going to get rid of them completely, those plaques, but you can, you can make them regress to the point where you don't have symptoms anymore. And if you know, and if, you know in physics, there's, whose law is it? It's the, the resistance varies as the fourth power of diameter. So if today you're f feeling fine and tomorrow you start developing angina, when you exercise, you're, you, know, you get chest pain, all you have to do is get back to where you were yesterday, right? So say you were 49% yesterday and today you're 50%, go back to 49% and your symptoms are gone, right? And um, it doesn't take a lot of change. So that's a significant difference from 53 to 46%. We're going to talk more about that tomorrow, uh, next, next week as well. He did uh, occasionally use statins if he couldn't get their cholesterol under 150. <clears throat> so these participants uh, all had severe pro progressive triple vessel disease. In the eight years before the study, the 11 participants, so it's not a huge study, but it's so powerful it doesn't really matter, they had 37 cardiovascular events. Um, but after they got in the study, they had no more events. So in other words, they were acting as their own controls. Because people say, well, it's not a randomized control study, right? But these were people who were really sick before, and afterwards they're not sick anymore. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to see something, something important has changed. So this article was originally published in 1995, uh, and again, we're going to talk about it tomorrow. But this is another article from um, resolving the cor uh, coronary artery disease epidemic through plant-based nutrition based on his own research. And what does he say? The world's advanced countries have easy access to plentiful high-fat high food. Ironically, it is this rich diet that produces atherosclerosis. In the world's poorer nations, many people subsist on a primarily plant-based diet, which is far healthier, especially in terms of heart disease. To treat coronary heart disease, a century of scientific investigation has produced a device-driven, risk-factor-oriented strategy. Nevertheless, many patients treated with this approach experience progressive disability and death. This strategy is a rearguard defensive one. In contrast, compelling data from nutritional studies, population surveys, and interventional studies support the effectiveness of a plant-based diet and aggressive lipid lowering to arrest, prevent, and selectively reverse heart disease. In essence, this is an offensive strategy. This is the most important part. The single biggest step would be to have United States dietary guidelines support a plant-based diet. An expert committee purged of industrial and political influence is required to assure that science is the basis for dietary recommendations. Well, as we just learned, we don't have that, right? These committees are definitely, um, not, have not been purged. So, <clears throat> how did he do it? Well, the physician was personally committed to maintaining a low-fat diet. He didn't personally have heart disease, but he felt, too, for one thing, he felt very power, strongly that he should be on the diet, but also, he wanted to support his patients. So he needed to go on this diet with him to prove that it was possible, so he did. So, like I said, we'll talk more about that next week. So, you might think I'm a megalomaniac. I've written my own laws. <laughs> so this is Barnett's first law. You're going to hear about Barnett's second law in a few weeks. Expensive therapies will be more widely known than cheap ones, even if they are not nearly as good. So I'm going to substitute the word therapy now for things that you have around the house. So this is my shaving mug, right? We'll pretend that's the, uh, the, the problem is shaving. I actually do shave. And the therapy is the shaving mug. So it works just as well as shaving cream. It doesn't cost anything. Nobody makes any money. And there's no ads on the Super Bowl, right? So why would anybody be interested in selling you a shaving mug? They're not. You know, CVS doesn't. They want you to walk in and buy a can of shaving cream, right? But this doesn't. I, I fill it with little pieces of soap that are about to go down the sink, right? And so I've never. I don't, I don't even buy soap for it. And I, I did finally find a vegan shaving uh, a brush for that. <laughs> let's find this first law. Anyway, let's go back to the power play here. Um, and my thing, which is the recent one, right? So here's the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. They are standing in front of the White House, January 2011. And why are they standing there? Well, by the way, that's, uh, that's Michael Greger. Who knows, my, who's seen Michael Greger? He's spoken in Rochester quite a bit. and. Uh, <clears throat> He's got a great website. I highly recommend going to his website. He produces a new video every day. <laughs> every day. It's only three or four minutes. It's, uh, I highly recommend watching it. He's also extremely funny. In fact, um, I don't know whether he would want me to say this or not, but my, my style of giving PowerPoint presentations is because I've seen a lot of his. Uh, <clears throat> So, angered by the White House's almost non-existent response to the growing epidemic of obesity in the United States, as well as refusal to review alternatives to the USDA's My Pyramid, earlier this week, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine delivered a six-foot-tall illustration of their alternative, the power plate. 
The power plate is a simple, colorful graphic depicting a plate divided into four food groups, fruits, vegetables, grains, and legumes, says PCRM President Dr. Neil Barnard. I spelled his name wrong, sorry. Or did I? No, that's how you spell it. Um, there are no confusing portion sizes and food hierarchies to follow. The power plate simply asks people to eat a variety of all four food groups each day. The power plate is based on research supporting the nutritional value of plant-based diets. The traditional food pyramid has been in use for nearly 20 years, and obesity and diabetes have only become worse. In January 2011, PCRM entered a lawsuit against the USDA and the Department of Health and Human Services after the petition requesting that the power plate replace my pyramid was ignored. What happened? Five months later, the USDA unveiled my plate. That was January 2nd, uh, June 2nd, 2011. So remember which one came first. So here's a quiz. You guys like quizzes, right? You wouldn't be in a class if you didn't like quizzes. Which of the following contains the most potassium? Skim milk, one cup. Banana, medium. Medium potato. Two ounces of cheddar cheese. Or one cup of cooked black beans. Okay, raise your hand if you think it's the skim milk. How about the banana? How about the potato? How about the cheddar cheese? How about the black beans? Okay, you guys are good. Okay, the answer is, most people think it's the banana, right? Because that's what everyone thinks. It's actually the potato. So when your doctor, when you're on, on um, diuretics for your hypertension, and your doctor's worried that your potassium is going to get too low, he says, put a banana on your cereal. Right? Why is that? I don't know. Maybe there's a banana lobby. Or it's, just, you know, or it's just, you know, it's just an urban legend, whatever. All fruits and vegetables are loaded with potassium. And they have very little, uh, very little sodium. So they're great for people with hypertension. Just eat lots of vegetables. <clears throat> so which of the following contains the most calcium? Like I said, it doesn't really matter. Not that it really matters. What contains the most calcium? A cup of milk? Two cups of broccoli, 10 medium figs, or calcified orange juice. I mean, sorry, fortified calcium orange juice, one cup. All right, Oops. let's go back. What's the guess? Who says the milk? You guys are too smart for that, right? What about the broccoli? Figs, orange juice. It turns out they are all about the same. But the broccoli wins, right? So, we tell people you need 1,300 milligrams of calcium every day, especially if you're a postmenopausal woman, right? But it turns out you really only need 600 milligrams. So, if you just had four cups of broccoli, or two, two cups of broccoli and 10 figs, you'd hit the 600. If you add that to that, lots of greens, you're going to get lots of calcium that way too. Bok choy, I mentioned those, kale, spinach, all those things are loaded with calcium. Um, because your doctor probably will be unhappy with you if you don't hit the 1300. So you got to figure out some way to do it without, and you don't want to take calcium tablets. Uh, it turns out actually, and we're going to talk about it more later on, but I'm actually running ahead now, which has never happened to me before, <laughs> um, that actually taking calcium su suppresses the active form of vitamin D in your body. Because vitamin D is used to, it helps you absorb vitamin D from your intestine. Well, if your calcium levels are high, it's going to say, well, I don't need so much vitamin D. But it turns out that the active form of vitamin D is protective against prostate cancer. And that's the theory, anyway, about why. But it is, I mean, it is an observable fact that um, high calcium diets uh, increase your risk of uh, prostate cancer. <clears throat> so, as a percentage of calories, which of the following is highest in protein? Again, not that it really matters, because I told you if you're living on a whole foods, plant-based diet, you're going to get plenty of protein. But, is it the whole milk? Is it the 2% milk? Is it the broccoli? Cheddar cheese? Navy beans? Kale? Or McDonald's hamburger? Now, notice I didn't give you serving sizes here, right? Because we're talking about percentages now. And you need to start thinking in terms of percentages. But, who thinks, who? Yell it out, what do you think wins? Kale. Kale. Oh, Navy beans. 2% milk. Thank you for saying that. The answer is the broccoli. It's 44% calories from protein. And coming in second is kale. Right? So you, how much, what percentage of calories from protein do you need to have in your diet so you don't get protein deficiency? You all a number. 10, 15%? That's a reasonable guess. You really only need about 7 or 8% of your calories to come from protein. So let's say 10% to be on the safe side, right? 
And actually beyond that, protein can cause mischief in your body. You don't need more than that. So there's really no whole food that's got less than that, except for maybe a few fruits like apples. Um, but broccoli, my God, 44% of the calories come from protein. And believe it or not, 4% of the calories come from fat. Who thought that broccoli had any fat in it, right? But it's got whole cells, right? It's a living thing. It's got to have all of it. <clears throat> so now we're going to show a little video here. Let me turn, turn this off. And there may be a few disturbing images in this. So I apologize, but they, they only last about two seconds each. It's very quick. If they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about answers. Monsanto? 
How about that? Exactly. exactly. So that's um, Thomas Pynchon. It's this crazy novelist who wrote Gravity's Rainbow. And I've been looking at that quote now for since 1991, because I got out of Dean Ornish's book then. And it keeps making more and more sense to me every time I see it. So remember that. <clears throat> so here's some examples of the wrong questions. <clears throat> Where do I get my protein? Well, that's the first question every vegan gets asked, right? Where do you get protein? Well, he's a vegan. He's getting it from green leafy vegetables and plant material. Where do I get my calcium? She gets it from green leafy vegetables. In fact, she gets, has so much calcium that she can put it in her milk. She doesn't have to eat, drink, drink milk. She gets it and puts it in milk, right? Where do you get your iron? Well, I'm a vegan, right? Where do we get our B12? Those are the kids. So B12 is an animal product. It comes from bacteria, actually, if that's an animal. And you get it from eating dirt. So that's the one um, supplement that we recommend, and that should be on one of your handouts about always take B12. But pretty much all Americans are B12 deficient anyway. Pretty, pretty much everybody should be on B12. And in fact, if you look at uh, populations, vegans tend to have a, a better B12 status because we worry about it more. So we, I mean, I take B12 every day. How much? Uh, it take uh, about a thousand. It doesn't really matter actually. Over the small, if you do it every day, take the smallest tablet you can find. And we're not recommending multivitamins. Just the B12 tablet itself. You can only, you only need 2.4 micrograms a day, and the smallest ta caps, uh, tablets I think are 500 micrograms. But we're going to talk about that more later. How you absorb it. But the smallest tablet you can find is fine. If you're taking it every day, if you're taking it once a week or once a month, you need bigger ones because you store it for three years. It's really hard to become B12 deficient. You have to work at it because you store it for so long. So, so these are examples of the right questions, at least in my opinion. Where do you get your Lipitor? <laughs> You're on the standard American diet, right? You must be on Lipitor. Or where do you get your antihypertensive? Or where do you get your insulin? Or your chemotherapy? I know this seems kind of insensitive of me, but really think about it. Why do, why do I have to be on the defensive? The only thing I have to take is B12. So, whatever happened to those kids? <coughs> we heard there, before there was, there was only two of them one time, back in 1990. There they are with a, uh, a vegan Galapagos tortoise. <laughs> Got pretty big. It's probably a couple hundred. I think you knew Darwin, actually. <laughs> Old, old Here we are. That was in the Galapagos Islands. This is crossing the Panama Canal. And uh, here we are in 2005. Watch the little guy in the middle. We were worried he wasn't going to grow. Because <laughs> he's vegan, right? How could he grow? But there he is. <laughs> Still vegan after all those years. Obviously weak bone and brain damaged. <laughs> So there's the oldest, she's, that's Rebecca, she's an Oberlin graduate student, or she's an Oberlin grad, and graduate student now. Liz is a graduate from Colgate, and she's a graduate student getting her master's in um, musical theater composition. I get to talk about my kids at this class, it's great. <laughs> Nate's a whiff and poof, he's uh, just finished his junior year at Yale, and uh, he's now uh, one of the a singer, in the, in the, he's a music major. So, and there they are later on in 2009. So this is last August, uh, about a year ago, last August. You know, um, you know, anybody know what a 46er is? So it's 46 high peaks in the Adirondacks. Yeah, sure. So I finished, I finished uh, on Gray Peak on August 10, 2012. And Rebecca and Nathaniel came. <coughs> Nathaniel already has his 46. We got him in the 17. <laughs> it was kind of a rainy day, as you can see. And you can see he's holding a bottle of champagne. And Rebecca has this um, uh, little patch made to wear, a great peak, pa uh, great peak patch. And Elizabeth, who's our city girl, wasn't there, but there she is. <laughs> so, do not share this with anyone who will put me out of business. Uh, eat more fruits and vegetables. And go outside and run around. Thank you. So I can take questions now, or it's a little early. It's not quite 9 o'clock, so, yes? The, uh, what are your thoughts about the paleo diet, which kind of eliminates the 
my understanding of it, and I'm, I'm sort of a novice, I'm going to say. Yeah. But from my understanding, it eliminates the lagoons and the grains. Um, right. So the paleo diet, diet, well, I could spend a lot of time talking about it, actually. We definitely don't recommend it. It's really kind of an Atkins diet, which is, you know, all fat and protein and meat. Um, there's, I, well, I, I should say, uh, to, in a reductionist sure. view, specifically the idea about uh, eliminating legumes and multigrain. Okay, so that, he's asking about eliminating legumes and multigrain grains. Um, there, can you hear me in the back, by the way? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the reasoning there is because that's not a nap, that wouldn't be something we evolved eating, right? They don't eat dairy either, because obviously dairy is totally unnatural, and there's no way to have a dairy industry if you're you know, a caveman. Um, and you can make, certainly make the argument that our ancestors did evolve eating meat, and probably insects and grubs and worms and all kinds of, anything they can get their hands on, really. Um, the, there's a, couple, a bunch of ways to answer that, but I think the most important thing is to just empirically, is it really a healthy diet? And I don't think that's, that's been demonstrated. So, um, do you have anything to say about the paleo diet? Um. When we went to Vegetarian Silverfest this year, a couple of the speakers talked about it, and if you, the newsletter that's in your packet, um, in the report on the Summerfest, it actually goes into quite a bit of detail about one of the speakers. Um, so, but, but one of the things that impressed me was there's a nutritionist named Brenda Davis, who's just a wonderful expert, and she actually talked about studies that showed that to the extent that, you know, they have these anthropological um, result, findings, and to, to the extent that she could best figure, the ancient diet is the closest modern diet to that ancient diet is a vegan diet. So, uh, you know, I think that, that it, it's, it's possible that early man ate as much meat as, as he or she could get their hands on, but it may not have been that much. You know, so there's arguments about was the hunter or the gatherer more um, prevalent or more successful, I should say. And um, she actually, very persuasively, she, she looked at studies to show that, um, you know, you can argue whether we really need to try to mimic that, but that the closest thing that does is, is a vegan diet. So uh, there's also another very interesting, um, I, 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 it's summarized in that article, the idea that there's some scenarios for how hum, early humans hunted that are pretty unrealistic, like such as that they ran down game and they exhausted the game and then, and, you know, you can debunk some of that stuff, too, but... Right. Well, I think the, the, sort of, the lesson is you, people are going to keep coming up with new diets, and then you're going to hear about them and say, well, how come that one doesn't work, or what's wrong with that one? So you need to have a sort of a system in place to think about it. And the way I think about it, for using the, the logic arguments, it's, it's kind of fun to think, well, how did our ancestors evolve? And, um, and that's an argument in favor of the paleo diet, or in some people's opinion. Um, I have people who are kind of on our side who argue that humans are not designed to eat meat. We're really plant eaters, and if you look at the length of our gut or the shape of our, I mean, we don't have the fangs, right? You know, our canines are pretty pitiful, they're tiny, right? So we're not really carnivores, carnivores in that sense. And yet, we can look around the planet and see perfectly well that there are people who clearly eat a lot of meat and do reasonably well. So you have to kind of put it, in, I think you have to put it in different context. And the context is what really works. And um, you know what populations are, tend to be healthy, and the, if you look around the planet, the, the healthy populations are the ones that are uh, <coughs> you know, living on vegetables, really, with minimal animal products. And the China study, um, you know, he looked at correlation between various illnesses and how much meat and/or dairy they were consuming. Not a lot of dairy, but 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 meat for sure. And basically came to the conclusion that there was no safe level of meat. Of meat. That the lower you went uh, 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 in terms of consuming animal products the less likely you would develop diseases of affluence, heart disease, cancer, that's not a good you know, question. Another way to look at it is that to be successful from an evolutionary perspective, you just need to live, live long enough to reproduce. Right. So if you're out there and you're just trying to keep the generations going, then you know you eat anything and everything. But what what is going to bring you longevity? And that may be a different diet <coughs> how some plant Right. Yes? What are the health problems that vegans have and in their elder years? <laughs> That's a great question. What health problems do vegans have in their elder years? Well, we haven't gotten there yet, so we don't really know. But I'll let you know. Um, yeah, sense of clarity. Yeah, right. Are there any elderly vegans here? Um, 
That's a really great question. I'm not prepared for that. I didn't know if you knew any elder vegans or not. You know, all the diseases we hear about are, uh, you know, animal protein diet right. based. But that's a know. great question. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you that you can have a bad vegan diet. So you could be a junk food vegan. You could live on potato chips and soda yeah. and be technically a vegan. So just because you're vegan doesn't get you off the hook. You need to be eating a whole food plant-based diet with very little oil. That's because um, we, we certainly know vegans who, who are ethical vegans who didn't get very old, you know, mm -hmm. and um, killed over. So There's that book, The Blue Zone, that blues. addresses that very question. Looking at centenarians, right, world. right. What do they say? <laughs> the blue zones. So she's talking about the blue zones. The, the, the author Dan Buechner, and right. it's not necessarily that uh, he doesn't necessarily indicate that they're all um, vegetarian or vegan right. diets, but right. I think that there is a trend there that they do tend more towards a vegetarian type diet. Right. So if you want to look into that, that's interesting. Thank you. Well, yeah. so that book profiles Dr. Wareham, the Seventh Day Adventist. Oh, right. He's 97 years old. So does anybody person. know about Dr. Uh, oh, Wareham? Yeah. I'm gonna, we're talking about him next week. He's uh, 97 now, or whatever, 98. He must be 98 by now. But anyway, he's a cardiac surgeon. He retired when he was 95 oh from cardiac surgery. Yeah. So, yeah, it's pretty impressive. And then, yes? Uh, what are your thoughts on vitamin D? Did you keep it different food? So vitamin D, um, oh, you can. You can get it from milk. <laughs> you know vitamin D, right? So what, you know why vitamin D is in milk, right? Because it's added. So... Um, there actually aren't a lot of great sources of vitamin D other than tablets, right? Or going out in the sun. So, um, I mean, there's a little bit of vitamin D in um, mushrooms. There's some fish that have some vitamin D. And, um, but you make an incredible amount if you go out in the sun. It's like 30, you make like 30,000 units in 20 minutes. What do you think of healthy vitamin D levels? What do I, th I don't, uh, she's asking what do I think is a healthy vitamin D level? And I'm not really up on that, I know that people think that most of us need a higher level. Uh, if you ask Caldwell Esselstyn, he would say that's a very reductionist approach. You know, it's really not about your vitamin D level, it's about everything else. Because what's the cure for a low vitamin D level? Well, the cure is to take vitamin D. Well, that's not very natural. <laughs> so, you know, it may be, it may be, I'm not saying it's not necessary, and truthfully, in the winter, I do take vitamin D. I'm, I have doubts about it. I'm the only, the, since, you're, since you're asking about supplements, I'll just tell you. The only supplements that we take are vitamin D12 and vitamin D. Um, occasionally, I will, when I'm, depending on what I've just read, I'll take, the, uh, these, there's these DHA capsules, EPA, DHA, because everyone thinks you should have fish oil, right? And fish oil is from fish, so I don't eat, eat that. But there's a vegan form of that called these little ca capsules that basically have this oil that comes from algae. Because the fish don't make omega-3 fatty acids, right? Where do they get it? They get it from the green leafy vegetables in the ocean. They get it from algae. And you can get omega-3 fatty acids from eating greens, because there's lots of it in greens, and from uh, uh, ground flaxseed. So I do take one or two tablespoons of ground flaxseed every morning on my cereal. I don't consider that a supplement, because it's a whole food. If it were oil, if I were just drinking flaxseed oil, then I would consider that a supplement. I really don't recommend flaxseed oil. Flaxseed oil comes in a black container, and it has to be refrigerated as soon as you get it home. And the reason is because it breaks down as soon as it gets exposed to light or if it gets too warm. So anything that is that unstable, you should be really wary of. And it smells like paint because it is paint. It's also linseed oil. So, you know, that, those are the two supplements, vitamin D and vitamin B12. And maybe the DHA, EPA capsule. But it looks like when you actually look at the scientific studies, even though your cardio cardio a lot of cardiologists recommend um, fish oil, it looks like it may be counterproductive and that there may be more health issues associated with taking the supplements. So, and we'll get, we're going to talk about that more. So there's some contradictory evidence about fish oil even. Right, that's what I was just saying. Yeah. yeah. So fish oil, especially, the trouble with fish oil, of course, it's, it's highly, it's a lot of it's contaminated with um, PCBs and mercury. So, any other questions? Yes? Um, on the slide about the B12, you said that it's from bacteria. Right. So, in terms of people that are eating meat and asking you about B12. So is B12 in meat as a bacteria? Uh, good so like question. if you're, if, yeah, like in terms of, I know you mentioned too that we're all probably picking up more of it. Right. Non no, the, B, the, the B12 in meat is actually in the meat. Okay. Um, 
it, assuming it wasn't too contaminated with feces, which is you know, also a problem. But, um, but B12 is produced by bacteria, and actually your gut produces B12. The bacteria in your gut produce B12. The issue is whether you can really absorb that B12. It, there's evidence that some people can, some people can't. It's just one of those things that um, you actually really only, only need, to get, need to take a B12 supplement once a month, because like I said, you store it so, so effectively. But if you became B12 deficient, you would get really sick. And the headline in the newspaper would be, vegan dies of B12 deficiency, or becomes paralyzed because of B12 deficiency, right? It would not be a headline, however, if, uh, you would never see a headline, meat eater has coronary bypass graft. You would never see that, right? Because that's the norm, right? So when we're part of a minority, minorities always get picked on, because anything we do that's different is, well, it must be something wrong with it. So I'm um, sort of beating by the bush there, but the B12 is easily obtainable in vitamins. Some people get it from, um, you can get it in yeast, and we'll just have, you know, um, yeast that has vitamin B12 in it that's net more natural, but I just don't think it's worth it. So it's then, sorry, so in the sure. meat, does that mean that they're using like plants or dirt or whatever to get it? Oh, why sauce? is it in the meat? Like, why, like, that's what I was saying. Oh, uh, I yeah, eventually it, com eventually it ultimately comes from bacteria. So cows, I think, actually do absorb it from their own rumen. I'm pretty sure about that. They get the B12 that way because the B12, the bacteria producing in their gut, there's no there's no mammal cells that can make B12, mm -hmm. but the but the bacteria can make it, and I'm pretty sure that's where the cows get it, and the carnivores obviously get it from meat that they're eating. So at some point, somebody started with the bacteria. Okay. So, yeah. get, look that up and get back to me, okay? okay. All right, thanks. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you all for coming.